All right. So, um, Nolan, uh, thanks a lot for being here today and for teaching us a little bit more about Igby. Um, as you gathered from the breakout room that you were just in, um, many of us are using Igby to analyze RNA-seq data. Um, some of us are also interested in using Igby to analyze chip-seq data, potentially. Um, some of us have been using the pollen tube data that are already integrated into Igby. Uh, but I think every project would also like to learn more about how to go out, find other data sets, and load them into Igby, um, uh, which is why we've asked you to come and talk to us today. So do you want to start by just like introducing yourself and um, you know, giving, giving us a little preview of what you're going to walk us through today? And I'll go ahead and mute myself. Yeah, so I just, like, thanks for inviting me. I'm um, always happy to talk about Igby. Uh, so I'm at UNC Charlotte. I work with Dr. Anne Lorraine. Um, I guess I'm a research associate, bioinformatician. Um, I've worked on Igby now for almost six years. So in kind of various capacities. Um, I think, so yeah, I, I, I kind of have some things prepared. I think we can also, I mean, if anyone has any specific questions or, you know, you kind of want to know how to do something. Um, I think for myself, it's really important to kind of understand, you know, what, when you're trying to load data, like what are you trying to load? Um, how, like what is an IGB genome? What is an annotation? What is a graph? Um, those are kind of the main concepts. Um, so I, yeah, I guess Mark, is there is there something specific you'd like me to start with, or um, I mean, I, I was going to start off with how to load a custom genome, just so people could kind of under, could understand, um, you know, what a genome is in IGB, and then we'll kind of add our own annotations in the form of RNA seq data on top of that. Um, Nolan, that sounds great. I think that we're you know we want to learn. Um, how to work with Igby in general. Uh, I think the particular thing that we'd be interested in doing is loading new RNA-seq data sets onto the existing tomato genome that is integrated in Igby. Um, but there are also some data sets in Arabidopsis that we want to be able to look at. Is that right, Allison? Yeah. So um, do, you, do you know where, I guess, can you point me towards some of the data you'd like to have in Igby or? Ah, uh, yeah, so, um, and I see that Rob Reed has joined. Um, so there are, for example, there's some publicly available RNA-seq data sets on unpollinated pistols, which is a tissue from uh, tomato. Um, and right now, if we were able to analyze some pollen tube data, but uh, those are the only samples that are currently loaded in Igby. So that's just an example of, we'd like to be able to know what's required to go out into SRA, um, get RNA-seq data, and then integrate them into Igby, either locally, you know, for just us to analyze or permanently so that other people could analyze them. Gotcha. Um... You know, generally the studies that are done and uploaded to SRA are going to be kind of the raw data, so the FASTQ data. FASTQ data yeah. is, is you, know, um, you know, just where you get back from the sequencer. So FASTQ files are, you know, we cannot view in, in IGB. Um, I guess this is kind of more for students if they're interested in this kind of thing. But, um, you know, so that would have to be run through ideally the same pipeline that you're viewing your own data in. Um, and then from there, it's kind of a question, yeah, do you, probably it would just be hosted in the same way, um, you know, Dr. Lane could put that in a quick load uh, and then host that on, online in the cloud and then make that available. Um, that would be kind of, you know, my recommendation in terms of how you would want to go about that or kind of the best case scenario. Um, in terms of you know, if someone has, 
aligned the data already and they have it sitting on a server somewhere, then it's a case of, um, you know, getting a hold of, of the data. Either you can, you know, download that data yourself and then view it in Igby, or you can access it just via the URL. Um, there's a couple assumptions that go with that, but, um, so basically yeah. there's, there's the fast queue file is the sort of basic thing, you know, the reads coming right off the sequencer. That's what you can get from SRA. And then, and that's kind of the industry standard for what a scientist needs to deposit in the database when they're going to report on a RNA seq experiment. Correct. But because, yeah, because you know, if I go through and I, you know, trim re or trim the fast queue files and, you know, make a bunch of alterations, then, you know, you you not you would not have access to the raw data. You know, so maybe I've done something wrong. Right, and and if I gather from what you're saying, what we need to be able to do is take that fast Q file and align it to a current annotation of a given genome, um, and then that would generate another file type that we could then work with in IGB. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. And what's the name of that file type? So that's usually going to be a BAM file, B-A-M. Yeah, uh, and that's .BAM, and the extension for that file is .BAM, is that right? Correct, yeah. So what you're saying is if, if you have access to a website that hosts like the BAM file for a given data set, we could work with that directly, um, or we could learn how to convert FASTQ to BAM. And you yeah. need the BAM to be aligned to your reference genome that's there. So reference 4.0 is in IGBY already. If you find a BAM online, it might be, a, it may have been aligned to something different. So you have to make sure the, ref, the original reference matches up. Correct, Nolan? Yeah, definitely. And sometimes that's not always obvious. Um, the human genome has many, many different versions and Sometimes people will, will post BAM files and not tell you exactly what they belong to. So it's sort of incumbent upon you to make sure, I mean, you can always go back to the fast queue, align it to the genome that you wanna use, and then you know exactly how the BAM file was constructed. That is the safest way to go. Yeah, so for, for the students, um, that's Rob Reed who uh, has that, I guess that's like a, his icon. Now oh, there he is in real Hi, life. Hi everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, Rob is, a, is also a bioinformatician at uh, UNC Charlotte, who's a collaborator of ours. Um, and he's actually been working with us to take some FASTQ files and get them converted to BAM files that we could view on the most recent annotation of the tomato genome. So Nolan, in terms of like what we, what you can help us with today, maybe we could work on the part um, that starts with a BAM file and see how we would work with that in IGBY. Yeah, and so I thought it would be kind of beneficial to be able to look at what's in these files. So a BAM file is a binary file. If you tried to open it um, like in a text editor, you know, it would just be a bunch of gibberish. So instead, if you look at the, um, the folder that everyone downloaded, there is a um, folder called files. And within there, you have a SAM file. The SAM file is a human readable version of a BAM file. Um, these files tend to be very large because they're not compressed. Um, so I put a, a very tiny amount of data in it. Um, but it, it kind of, it can show you, you know, what's, what's in there and, you know, how that then is, is read into IGBY. Um, so we can open the dot SAM with any text editor that we happen to have on our machine. Sorry, could, could we clarify where is this file again? Uh, so is, does everyone have the it's biology 0440 IGBY files? Uh, okay, sorry. Yes, hang on. Uh, yep, 
good. All right, so I have that aligned reads E unicornis underscore RNA seek. I have that open dot Sam. Yep. And so this file is effectively a BAM file um, and it itself can be read into IGB. Um, so what's in it is effectively each, each row is a read. Um, you know, so when you're looking at IGB kind of in the example before where you had, you know, different reads across the genome, um, here each row is a read and you can see it's got kind of a unique identifier. Um, you see the chromosome, so chromosome one, uh, and then a location. And then you can also see, so you should see the very, it's a fifth line. Um, you can see the read itself, so as in the base pairs that comprise it. And then the next column is the quality scores for those bases. So in IGBY, what we're doing is we're just kind of reading this row by row and saying, okay, the read you know, is on this chromosome, starts here, and has this sequence. Are we supposed to be looking at something? Because I don't have anything on my screen. Yeah, Mark, is it okay if I share my screen? Oh yeah, I have to give you, do I have to give you permission? I, th I think so, yeah. Yeah, sorry, Nolan, go for it. You don't want to see what's on my screen because I'm not sure that I have this open quite right. Mine looks kind of like a mess. <laughs> Oh, that's much better. So what are you using there, Nolan, to read that file? What what editor is that? Sublime Text 2. There's many, many different editors. I think um, Adam also works. Um, if you're on Mac, I think just text edit will work. Um, you could try I some it in Microsoft Word and it's it it's ugly. Uh yeah, I was gonna yeah, open sure. text editor. Um, maybe Excel as well might be better. Excel might be able, I think Excel can, that you might have to change the file extension from .sam um, it's a, a, to TSV because it's a tab separated. All right, while I, um, while I open the text editor, Nolan, why don't you describe exactly what's in one of the rows and how that relates to you know what's being displayed in Igby. Yeah, so I there's a lot of, okay, so the first, actually let's start here. The first couple columns are just defining the chromosomes. So this particular genome has three chromosomes and it's just saying what the length of those chromosomes is. Um, it, it's important for reasons that have to do with um, the way this file is indexed for the BAM file, which if anyone, if you're interested in, we can talk about in depth, but not really important. Um, so you have these header lines and then this is where your data actually starts below that. So each line then is going to be a read that would appear in IGBY. Um, we've got kind of a unique identifier here. Um, some kind of flag, but then we've got the chromosome. So this particular read appears on chromosome one, and I think it starts at base pair position 3,629. Um, some additional flags, and then we have uh, the actual sequence, right? So this is the sequence of that read. Uh, and then this column here, is the quality score? It is the um, quality score for that read, and it might kind of look like a bunch of junk. If you look at them often enough, you start to recognize which ones are good and bad. Um, hash marks are bad, so if you see a lot of them, it generally means your data is garbage. Um, and then the rest of it are kind of just a lot of flags. So. Uh, a lot of this is actually kind of determined by the aligner and, you know, what kind of, you know, was, your, was this aligned kind of with RNA-seq data in mind or whole genome sequencing or bisulfite sequencing. So, um, you know, this... So, uh, Sam, Nolan, one, one quick yeah. question. That uh, nucleotide sequence, 
first of all, it doesn't have any ends in it, which is good. The next one does, but second, it looks to me like it's a lot shorter than 150 base pairs, which is what I thought the length of each read was. Uh, it varies. So this, this data is not from the, the tomato. This is from oh, got it. a much <laughs> older data set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, I, yeah, of course, you don't have our data. My bad. So well, yeah, I was trying to choose a, a, a smaller data subset as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think this one is just there's 36 space pairs in length. Yeah, got it. So this, this is like a much, much older back when sequencing was much smaller. Um, so got it. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the same file in general, I mean, there's there's a lot of information that can be in here, but that at the end of the day, the main thing to know is, you know, it, it tells you the position of the read, the sequence of the read, and the quality of the read. So, so by taking the position and the read, then Igby can place this at a particular place um, in the genome. How many rows are in this file? Uh, I chose the first 100,000, so I think it's... And in a typical RNA-seq experiment these days, uh, how many rows would be in a BAM or SAM file? Billions, usually. Billions, with a B? Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, this, this was a fraction of, this was a relatively small file to begin with, and this is a fraction of it. But um, there are, there's actually a, a data set called Genome in a Bottle that is kind of a reference human genome that has really, really um, a large depth of sequencing. And the BAM file for that, which is a compressed version, the compressed version is usually about um, a tenth of the size of the SAM file. But the BAM file in that case is several hundred gigabytes. So wow. these files can be very, very large. Got it. I mean, yeah, you're essentially resequencing the genome many thousands of times over. So yeah, it's a lot of a lot of nucleotides. Actually, if we want here, I'll, I'll, I was going to talk about um, kind of show you what what a genome is in IGB. Um, just that'd that, be great if that helps. I don't know people kind of conceptualize it. I think this is one of the main things that I had to kind of think about when I first started here. Um, so within IGB, if you're looking at the home screen here, if you go to File and open Genome from File, so we're going to open a custom genome, and I've provided the files that we need for this. So the file we're gonna choose here. Um, so we need to provide a reference sequence. So you think about a genome, a, a genome in IGB is effectively just the sequence of the genome. Um, and well, actually, so in this case, it's a FASTA file. Yeah, sorry, it's a FASTA file, which it's another very common file type. Um, and it's very simple. All there is in it is, are the chromosomes and then the sequence for each chromosome. So this again is a very large file. Um, as you can see in this case, we've got our three chromosomes. So Nolan, does IGB automatically has the genome sequence of all of the organism that like I see here on your screen, or do you have to actually load them from an internet source or something like that? Yeah, so when we add a, a genome to IGB, we're, we're adding two files effectively. We're adding the genome sequence or the reference sequence, and then we're gonna add the, the gene annotation as well. So like if you click on you know, H sapien or, or A thaliana right now, what we will do is we'll go to our server and pull you know, whatever the reference sequence is. 
Um, and so it, you know, we try and keep that up to date as much as possible, but, you know, there's like thousands of new genomes every year. So it's, it's kind of one of those never ending tasks. Um, but yeah. Okay. So in this case, um, just to use kind of this, this, um, test data that I provided. So if you choose file and I'm going to go, So the option here is to select the FASTA file. So I'm in the PB files, files, um, sequence, e unicornis. Nolan, how many genera are there that contain a species unicornis? <laughs> uh, good question. <laughs> this is probably one of our, our, if you look at the Igby user's guide, this is our example file, is our, our unicorn genome. Got it which looks remarkably similar to the Arabidopsis genome, but that's just a coincidence. Mm. Um, these don't really matter. We can kind of just use whatever we want. Um, I have one little interesting fun fact about SAM files and BAM files. Um, you know, the BAM file, which is in binary format, um, for example, nag carline, uh, one of the pl you know, plants we care about, the, the binary or the BAM file is 16 gigs in size. That same SAM file, which is all text, is 89 gigs in size. So that gives you an idea of why we do it in BAMs and versus SAMs. The size discrepancy is huge. And it's always fun when someone in a shared Dropbox or Google Drive decides to throw 200 gigs worth of SAM files. And all of a sudden you wonder why you have no space. Um, okay, so here I've loaded my unicorn genome. And as you can see in AB, and I, it seems like uh, you know, watching your guys' um, class, you, you've, you've had some experience now with AB. So you kind of recognize you know, main screen. Um, so we've loaded our reference sequence, right? And basically it just looks like a whole lot of nothing. If we zoom in on any position, we can load a sequence and effectively all IGB is doing is it's going to that FASTA file and retrieving, you know, these coordinates for this chromosome and saying, give me the sequence. So now we have that. So the second part of the genome, and usually if you click on, you know, homo sapien or whatever, um, you know, the tomato genome, um, we're also going to load an annotation on top of that. So, you know, in that case being um, the genes. So we stored the, the annotation gene data in bed files. And there are some competing annotation file types for this, but um, this one's probably the most easy to kind of use and work with. So a bed file, kind of similar to a SAM file and that each row is a thing. So in this case, each row is a gene. Again, we have um, the position. So we've got the chromosome, where the gene starts, where it stops, the name of the gene. Um, and then this has to do with the numbers of exons and the lengths of those exons. So we're kind of just providing the information that Igby needs to then draw that gene annotation in there. So if we go to Igby, let's load our data. So we have our data locally. So it's just file, open file. I'm gonna load my bed file. And bed files tend to be pretty small. Um, you know, there's only so many genes. And so these we usually will just kind of load the whole thing at once, which I'm sure everyone's seen as well. So, you know, this now is kind of the normal view that you have to work with IGB. Um, and I hope that kind of, you know, explains what's happening when you click on a, a genome. We're loading two separate files or providing you access to two separate files. And then on top of that, so- Nolan, just real quick, sorry, to see 
all the vertical blue lines, which indicate the positions of genes, you need to click on the, the load data button once the file has been uploaded. Yeah, and actually, okay, so I went through that pretty quick. So normally we will load, like I think when you click on tomato or homo sapiens, we will load the bed file automatically um, just yeah. so there's something to look at. But with any data in Igby, as Rob just mentioned, I mean, you could be trying to load like an 18 gigabyte file. And if you tried to load all of that data, um, that data has to go into memory. And so you can kind of see down here, like I'm using so many megabytes of my almost four gig allotment of memory. And so if you tried to load an 18 gig file, it would just, it would run out of memory and lock up. So that's kind of why we have this load sequence and load data button. And we give you very manual control over being able to load your data. Um, if you want to try and load a whole chromosome's worth of BAM file, you know, hopefully your, your machine is strong enough to do that. Got it. Thanks. So. Now, if we want to load, so, okay, so we've loaded our annotation that is our genes. If we want to load another annotation, let's say, you know, from our RNA-seq study, uh, in that case, we're going to load the SAM file that we looked at earlier. So again, just file, open file. And I'll select my SAM file. Yeah, and so you can see that we're not going to, we're loading the file into Igby, or we're adding it to Igby, but we're not loading the data for it. And I know that this file is relatively small, so you know, we can go ahead and load a pretty big view of it. So actually, there's only, I think there's only data for about this first section of the genome. So I'm, I'm, I'm all the way on chromosome one, all the way to the left. So starting at zero, up to about the first 200,000 base pairs. And there we can see all of our reads. So reads are annotations. We're, we're adding additional annotations. So when you have your data, just remember down here in the um, these bottom tabs that you know if I wanted to change how this appears, um, this is going to be an annotation. So I think kind of um, <clears throat> what I saw everyone working on today, you know, you find your favorite gene and then start to kind of inspect. inspect that gene looking for, you know, whether it's splicing or um, just counting the number of reads that are occurring for any given gene. Um, nothing particularly exciting here, but. The other data type that... Sorry, Nolan, I, so I'm mean, just gonna pull the group. Is everybody, um, has everybody gone to the point, if you, you know, for those who've tried, where they can now see RNA-seq reads uh, on the unicorn genome? Is anybody having trouble? Like, actually, I'm not, I think I might've done something wrong where I'm seeing what looks like RNA seq reads, but they're in the annotation track, um, not in the RNA seq track. Does that make any sense at all to you, Nolan? Do you want to share your screen real quick just so I can take a look? Sure. So, oh, yeah. they're, oh I'm too far over. Yeah, I they're all it. the way to the left. I was trying to keep that file pretty small. Um, there we go. Okay, so 
what are all these things that are appearing? Are these, these are different annotations for the same gene? Correct, yep. Got it. And then these are the reads that would support or not support each of those annotations. Yep. All right, I will stop sharing. Thanks, Nolan. Anybody else need trouble um, getting to where Nolan is right now? All right. Go ahead, Nolan. Yeah, I think I've got this back. Okay, so the other file type that I, I would like to mention just real quick, um, kind of, I mean, the bread and butter, you know, is going to be your, your, your gene annotation file and then your BAM file, your BAM or SAM file. Um, from, if we're interested though, so like if you're doing an RNA-seq study or a CHIP-seq study and you're, you don't need all of the data that is within that BAM file, um, you know, maybe you're just interested in, well, you know, how, how much is this gene expressed? Then something like a graph file might be more useful um, or just to kind of help cut down on the amount of data you're looking at. So one of the files that I use quite often is called a bed graph file. And the data for it is really, really simple. It's about as simple as you can get. Um, all that it is is a location. So in this case, chromosome one, and this thing is gonna start at you know, this base per position and go to this base per position. And then it just has a value. So in this case for the RNA-seq, it's just counting um, how many reads overlap any given position. And so for instance, I'm, I'm really just picking things at random here, but at this position from here to here, there would have a value of two. There are two reads. From here to here, I guess, there would be a value of five. And so what that then looks like if we load that bed graph file, and I'm, I'm going to minimize down my SAM file because I don't want to, I don't want it taking up so much space. But again, we can go file, open file. I'm going to add my bed graph. And then I'm going to load the bed graph. And bed graph files, again, are, are very, very tiny. Uh, so usually, I mean, I'll, I will usually load a bed graph across an entire chromosome um, and then take a look at, you know, where I see spikes in expression. But what this is kind of telling us now is a quick way to look across and say, okay, what genes are highly expressed? So I can see here, whatever gene is at this position, this is highly expressed as a lot of read support for it. Um, another one around here, and then kind of a lot of nothing. And then this gene here seems to also be pretty highly expressed. So Nolan, um, given how simple the bed graph file is where you just have a starting position Oh, I, okay, so, so you have a starting position and an ending position for that read. Is that right? So the first one is 3628 to 3641. Yeah, so that's yeah. just one read. And then what does the two mean? There are two reads that have exactly that uh, beginning and end point. Yeah, so I think, Make sure it's three six. So if we look at the when we're developing new features for IGB, one of the things we have to do is create test files and kind of do sanity checks to make sure things appear as they do. So um, kind of imagine sitting here looking at a file and comparing it to what you see in IGB. Um, so if I kind yeah, of so zoom I see in those here. first two reads. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so at position three six two eight, we have two reads and that should go until position three, six, four. Yeah. In this case, one, because we count the last one. 
this is kind of the last one for the previous one, if that makes sense. So. Oh, then, I see. And then when the next read picks up, it says there are now a total of five over that position. Yep. And then next and so should be on. six, and then that nine. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you can quickly see the kind of the one to one relationship between the bed graph and then the reads themselves. So, that bed graph provides a way to display the reads in an orderly fashion over the annotation. And you can generate those bed graphs, you know, you can generate them for a hundred BAM files and then load a hundred bed graphs and look at them all at once because they're such tiny files. Whereas if you try to load a hundred BAM files all at once, you'd probably crash. And could you give us sort of a general definition for a graph the way you're using the word here? Yeah, so it's, it is very important in Igby um, because we kind of separate the logic that handles those different file types. So everything we've worked up to, so the, the bed file and the BAM file, right, were both annotations. The graph is just, or the, the bed graph, it's in the name, is a graph. Um, the graph, I, I'm not sure what a textbook definition for this would be, um, but it's basically just data that has a start and an end and a value. So I mean, basically what's in the bed graph is, is kind of what all graph file types are. Um, you, you don't get any and the, of the kind of- And the purpose of it is to, um, is to summarize uh, and condense data in a way that's easier to visualize. Yep. A lot of times for publications, you'll see, you know, if I'm showing, you know, my, my RNA-seq, you know, my treatment versus my control, you'll see that shown as um, a depth or a coverage graph, um, you know, showing that, you know, my treatment has 10 times as much expression as my control. Got it. I'm just going to go and see if I can load that um, bed graph. I haven't gotten to that yet. Yeah, so here, this is an example that I put on uh, our website where it's showing, so the, the blue is, is the control and the red is the experimental. And then the green here is actually chip seek data that's been overlaid. So you can see, um, I think the, the chip seek is affecting this gene here and the difference in expression between um, the control and the experimental. So an example of what you might see in a publication. So I think the, you know, we, we talked earlier about I, everything we've been loading right now has been local data. Um, Igby can load data from URLs, as I was saying before. So all of the same data that we've been looking at, I put um, into something called Cybers, which is a, a free resource provided by the National, or funded through the National Science Foundation. Um, so in this case, like, if someone had put up some data that I wanted to take a look at, um, all I would need is the URL to that data. So in this case, I can copy that link address for just the annotation, the bed file we were just looking at. Um, and just so I don't, I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of the data we have. Quick. So now instead of open file, I'm going to open a URL. And this is the URL that I had copied. Um, local files are always gonna load very, very fast. URLs are only gonna load as fast as your internet and the server speed. But you know, in this case, we get the same data. 
So now instead of pulling it from my local, I'm pulling it from that URL. So if you did, like I said, if you did find like a BAM file or something that you wanted to take a look at, that's all you would need to do. Um, get the URL. So Nolan, how, how common is it for people to post BAM files and, and where do they put them? It's really not that common. Um, I think Geo, and Rob, feel free to jump in on this because you probably know better than I do. I think like Geo will have a lot of process data. Um, Geo might, you know, any given Geo data set might have BAMs, but it's not like they are required to put it there. So yeah. you may or may not see it. Sometimes people have their own various lab sites where they host. Um, Yeah. So this is one that I use quite often just for demo purposes. This is a genome in a bottle. Um, so these are, are, there's a lot of sequencing data here. Um, they have, um, these are all different types of sequencing machines or sequencing technologies. And then you have um, several different samples to look at. But you know, this would be an example of, of a, a BAM that uh, is available freely um, that's posted online. So as I said before, this is a 120 gigabyte BAM file. So user beware. Got it. Uh, it, is, it is kind of rare um, to be able to find those URLs. And, uh, and probably part of the reason why it's rare is that they have a short shelf life because the genome annotation is constantly being updated. Yeah. And the good news is that RNA-seq reads have a very long shelf life because whether there are 30 nucleotides or 150 nucleotides, you can still align them to the genome and, and get counts. Yeah, so the, the FASTQ files are agnostic to the genome version. You know, you just, you align them to whatever genome version you're currently working with. Um, but yeah, that means that, that resources like the SRA, which have, or the um, European nucleotide, the ENA, um, you know, that's, that's most of what they have are going to be the, the FASTQ files. So, it, you know, it's up to you to do um, your own aligning to then be able to view those files. All right, sounds like we need to learn how to do aligning. <laughs> I know that we're not gonna do that right now. <laughs> if, I, I will say, and I, I've done a number of tutorials um, um, that, that are good for kind of teaching about building pipelines and whatnot, but um, Use Galaxy is a nice GUI-based tool that you can uh, you can make a free account. I think you have like 100 or 200 uh, gigabytes of space, and you can um, build alignment panel, uh, build alignment pipelines using that GUI, and it's it works pretty well, um, especially for kind of you know understanding what's going on. And we actually have um, we we link Igby links with Galaxy so that once you've created that BAM file. There's just a, a button that you have to click and it will send the data to Igby directly to view. From Galaxy. Yep. Oh, that's cool. All right. Um, Rob, do you ever use Galaxy? Probably not. Um, I don't use Galaxy because I get limited by space. Um, yep. So, Galaxy as I said, might be a, a way for some bioinformatics neophytes to uh, build some pipelines that we could use, right? Yeah, for sure. And it also kind of puts the logic there, which you kind of like, okay, I did this and then I did this and this, you know, how you go from sequence all the way to this, you know, ultimately say a bed file or the bed graph file. And you can actually, you get to see the progress nicely and Galaxy lays it out very, very, very well. All right. Well, maybe that's our next step. Well, so Nolan, it's surprisingly easy uh, to load these data sets once you have them, I would say. Thanks for showing yeah. us how to do this. 
I mean, if you have the, the local data or you have the URL, I mean, it's, it's, you know, like anything else, it's file open or file URL. I think the only way you can kind of blow things up or if you try, you know, you, you zoom all the way out to a big chromosome and try and load several gigabytes of data. Um, it, we will, we will fully let you do that. And, you know, if you run out of memory, you run out of memory. Um, if that happens, it's not a big problem. You just have to, you know, close Igby and reopen it. Um, yeah, I think it may have happened to a few of us um, today. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yeah, you disappear from the Zoom, you know, you dust yourself off and uh, come right back. It's a good argument that when you're buying laptops in the future, always shoot for as much RAM as you can possibly afford. Yeah, the fun fact, Igby uses one quarter of your total system memory. So I've got a 16 gig machine, so it's, it's using about four gigs. Um, you can actually change that to use a, a higher percentage if you want, but it kind of gives you an idea. So if you've got a four gig machine, then you know, you've only got one gig for Igby to use. Um, so Nolan, is there anything else that you wanted to show us during this uh, session today? Yeah, I think the last thing that I just wanted to kind of quickly touch on, um, and I include an example in file. So I'm going to jump back to the home screen and um, just load the, uh, so we, we can load the tomato genome. So over here on the left, under this available data, um, you'll note that there's usually stuff over here. Um, this is data that are hosted on Igby quick loads. And what that is, is it's, it's a, it's a directory structure um, that it's just kind of a way of organizing files and data into a way that's kind of just easier to work with. Um, and then we can kind of take that whole package and host it somewhere online. So all of this data here in this RNA seq folder is I think hosted, I'm guessing on Amazon. Um, and so I think, so within this quick or within the um, Igby files, there's a folder here called quick load. Um, and that will kind of demonstrate what this looks like. Um, I'm not going to go through how to build a quick load. It, it's one of those things that can be kind of easy, but also get a little bit complex um, in terms of the assumptions that you know you have to how you build this. Um, but ultimately, <clears throat> All you need to do to add a quick load is under this available data, sorry, I'll go back here, configure, and then data sources, you add. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna choose. <clears throat> Nolan, can anybody do this or is this just for Igby insiders? Uh, anyone can build these, um, and we have, let's see, we have a walkthrough on how to do that. So I think well, there's actually two of them. <clears throat> So in the user's guide, this will kind of explain how to um, either create a new quick load or how to add data to a quick load. Um, if it's something you want to do, I think, you know, it, it itself can kind of involve, I would say at least a good 30 minute discussion. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's how we're able to kind of very easily, you know, organize the data that you see and provide access to it. And there, it used to be that you could host quick loads on things like Dropbox. They've kind of gotten away from that. Um, they don't want people streaming hundreds of gigs of data on a regular basis. But Cyverse, which um, it's 
paid for by NSF, you can get, I think, 100 or 200 gigs for free if you make an account. And you can host quick loads there um, and then stream data to AV. So it's an easy way to, you know, make a quick load, host it somewhere, and then basically all that someone would have to do is if they had the URL for that quick load, they could just put that URL here and then they'd be able to view all that data that you're hosting. Okay. So a quick load is basically a collection of files that are organized in a nice way so that somebody could bring in a collection of reads and graphs and potentially annotations like all together. Yeah, exactly. It just, it, it, it makes it easier. Um, there, and actually, I did there, Dr. Lang pointed out, I had one mistake in mind. So there's a lot of assumptions about how this is organized. Um, if you have the earlier version of, I don't know, I, you might have to take a look at the, this version of this file called .2bit. Um, this name has to be exactly the same. So this, this part here has to be exactly the same as this folder name. Otherwise this will, break. Yep, that makes sense. Yeah, so if we have, you know, for the for the class this semester, um, if we have time to get together some files that we are loading locally, um, maybe as a public service, we could go through the trouble of figuring out how to make a quick load. Um, to add to the data that are easily accessible, say, for example, for tomato um, on Igby right now. Yeah. And then the only other thing I wanted to point out um, is, so the files we're working with today are, are the human readable versions of files. We, they're, they're good examples. It's nice to be able to see within those files, but that's generally not what we work with. Um, so there's a folder here called binary. These are the files that we usually work with. Um, so this BAM file is, you know, the binary version of the SAM file. Um, note that it has an index and that index is required. If you do not have that index, this, this .bam.bai, you will not be able to view the BAM file. So usually when um, this data is stored online or whatnot, these two files are always stored together. And then, so the annotation does file- Does that mean, sorry, Nolan, does that mean that if you were gonna load those locally, you'd have to load both at the same time? Uh, you just have to load the BAM file. Uh, we automatically then go, we search your computer effectively, um, or we go to, the directory where that BAM file is, and then we look to see if there's a BAI file in the same location. Got it, thanks. Um, so the same is true then. So the bed file has been gzipped, so it's .bed.gz, and then we've also created an index for it, .tbi. Um, you also would wanna leave these two files within the same location, because we'll look for the gz, or the, the .bed.gz, and then we'll automatically look for the .gz, .tbi. Um, the bed graph is all, the bed graph file is also gzipped and um, indexed with this .tbi. And then finally, the we don't use the, the FASTA file for the sequence, we use that two bit. Um, it's kind of like the BAM file, it's just a compressed version, um, though this one does not have an index. So, and any of these files, I mean, if you try and look at them, you know, they just look like a whole lot of nothing. And the advantage is they're just computationally way less demanding and they'll load faster and... Yeah, so the BAM file is 2.9 megabytes versus the SAM file, which is 18. Okay, so yeah, almost a tenfold savings on space. Yep. Could I ask cool. a... a 
probably very naive question about chip seek data formats. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so one data set that we're interested in seems to be reported as narrow peak yep. um, data. Is that something that's easy to import into 8B or not especially? It is. We, we do load narrow peak. So um, uh, I, I can kind of, <laughs> uh, for whatever reason, someone decided that there should be these different formats like narrow peak. There's also one called broad peak. Um, they're effectively just bed files at the end of the day. If you, if you were to open them up and look at them, um, they're just a slight variation of, of a bed file. Um, so we, we can view them and I think they just, they appear very similar to how a bed file would, would load an 8B. Um, yeah, it seems like bound formaticians um, invent a new file type every other day. So that's, that's also a game of kind of constant trying to catching up. Um, actually, I've got, let me see if I can find it real quick. There's a couple of really, really useful links that I will reference quite frequently. Let's see. So one, uh, in the AV user's guide, we'll have a list of all the different file formats that we support and then the extensions that those should have. Um, that's another fun thing. So FASTA can have many different extensions, but they all effectively mean the same thing. Um, we don't actually say we support narrow peak, but I know that we do. Uh, yes, yeah, so I guess we need to update this. But yeah, it's um, narrow. I think, I think it has the extension dot narrow peak. Yep. Open it. Yeah, and I, I've actually, I was just looking at the code for it the other day, so I, I know it's part of AV. Um, and apparently, UCSC is not up right now. Michelle asked a question. Um, a while back in the chat about changing the scale of the bed graph track. Um, how do you optimize and set the stack height? If we get a minute, it would be nice to address that. Yeah, yeah sorry. I, I, every time I change something in Zoom, I feel like the chat disappears. Yeah, that is annoying. It does it like if you if you stop sharing your screen and then come back to it, I think you lose all the prior chat. Yeah. Um, okay. So this um, is Allison. This page is also very helpful. Um, it describes a lot of the different file formats, um, and it's something I reference pretty frequently. So it, it describes you know things like bed format, like what are um, okay. Each of Terrific. the different columns within it. Um, Terrific. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So and here's narrow peak. So it describes. And if you look at it, it's very very similar to what a bed file is. Um, let me. Um, I had a question about narrow peak data and sort of using it for more stuff. So. I understand that it can be compared uh, or viewed as a bed file with, I think, IGB. Um, I'm just wondering how sort of that p-value from, from what I'm looking at, that measure of statistical significance sort of comes through on IGB, or is that something that doesn't get displayed? The other thing is also, can you take, say, um, a narrow peak file from one treatment um, and compare it statistically to a narrow, bit, narrow peak file from another treatment using IGB, or is that something that you have to use R for? Uh, to the first question, I believe there is a way to change the value. Let me see. It would, I don't have a narrow peak file on hand to, to test this with, but it's something we could follow up. Um, do you want to, I think I found one. Would you like to try it? It's, um, 
under the, do, do you want to give it a try? Yeah, where is it? Do we have one under here? Yeah, I, I just found some under um, GNC, the second from the top. And I think Max, con oh, it's Consensus Peaks there. And I think those are all, um, those are both, those all three of them are. Let's see how this works. Oh. No, I'm sorry. Um, Max Peaks is, I, I, I told you the wrong thing. You have to open um, the, oh, I think, no, no, that's right, I believe. And so you can you can tell what type of file it. Yeah, I think the one that says GNC one peaks. That's I believe a narrow peak file. I don't know you, if you. Yeah, you have to select it first. So you have to select the track. Select try the other one, GNC one peaks. The select the track label. I'm sorry. Yeah, so oh, it's yeah a that's little, a narrow peak. Okay. So he's he's just looking up what the file name is. So, yeah. So. Oh yeah, and if you and if then if you um, select the item in the display, I think oh perfect. I think if you uh, select that, it'll tell you some information about it. I think it'll tell you what the p value is from the file if there was one. Oh yeah. So p value, q value. Yeah. It was, tells you. Yeah. So that's so this, that information is coming from the program that created it, or Max, which is M A C S in this case. Um, I, I sort of looked at the p value. Is, is the p-value in this case not referring to the statistical p-value? This is, I mean, sure, 19. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, that can't be a p-value. Uh, it must, it's yeah. probably the minus log, the negative log, uh, base 10. I'm just, that's just a wild guess. Okay. Okay, that, that would make sense, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, NeroPeak looks like it shows as an annotation, and so you can change that label field um, to be whatever you know value you want, and then in theory each of these should show up. Let's see if we can find some more. Yeah, so in each of these would show with the p-value. So sorry, what's, so this is a, um, this is data from a, a chip seek. So the basic idea is that as, um, this sequence has been pulled down uh, with an antibody against some DNA binding protein. And the p-value that we'd be talking about would be what the likelihood that you would pull down this same sequence by chance? I think that's a pretty good way to put it. Basically, I mean, as, as you know, you know, Chipsy experiment uses an antibody that um, recognizes something that binds to DNA or a modification of DNA. And so this is the endpoint of a very long, um, series of data processing and analysis steps. So I, the, the end result here is that we're looking at a region where there was an enrichment of binding by GNC1 transcription factor. And there were many, many such regions and across the genome and of varying significance. And I think that's what the p-value refers to is the, the level of um, the, the, the chance that you would observe such a thing purely by chance. And I'm sure yeah, that I'm thanks. garbling this up a lot, but, but it, is a, it is the result of a statistical inference, inference analysis. Yep, yeah, thanks. That helps.
So could I could I ask a follow up question? So could we zoom back in on that, Nolan? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so what I'm curious about is that with ChipSeq, um, that so the extent of these bars is um, here. It looks like the p value is for that intergenic region between uh, these two genes. Am I interpreting that right? And is it? Yeah. And there are sort of these little blue hatch marks. So does that mean this is the p-value for the downstream gene and the, the other is the p-value for the upstream gene? Or what, what, why do we have two different p-values for the same region? That's a good question. I think it might have to do with, honestly, I don't know. I mean, it seems a bit weird, but it looks like whoever did this analysis and I think, I think it was someone in my lab actually <laughs> working with a collaborator, but it, it kind of looks like we've got two different peaks maybe identified from two different replicates maybe uh, from the same experiment. I mean, they both have the, they both have the same name and one is A and one is B. So I'm just wondering if maybe these are two different replicates. Um, to be honest, to, to be able to tell for sure, what we really need to do is read the associated paper. So there's a, okay. um, a yeah, yeah, I wish I could tell you more, but honestly, it does look to me like these are two different replicates, or maybe the result from analyzing the data in two different ways. I'm not sure. Um, in, the, in the data access panel, we've tried to be super careful about making it possible to look up the original paper, or at least find out where this came from, who was responsible for it. So next to the name of the data set, there's a number, there's, it says PRJNA. -R yep. Um, so that's, that's actually from the sequence read archive. So if, if you type that into Google, it should find it, the experiment for you. And then from there, hopefully you can locate the paper and find out more information about these, uh, what these files mean. Because as it stands, they're they're a little bit cryptic. I mean, you, if you were familiar with Arabidopsis, if you were familiar with transcription factors in Arabidopsis, you might recognize what these are. Um, but. but to Allison's question, I don't think there's a way a priori to know which of these two genes uh, GCN1 is regulating. I guess if I had to bet. I would bet on the one on the left, just because the peak doesn't overlap with the coding sequence of that gene, and it does on the one on the right. Um, but that would be totally a guess and might be wrong. Yeah, this is very typical of Arabidopsis. The genes are very yeah, the genes are right packed. next to each other. Yeah. <laughs> so it's almost impossible to say for sure. So. I mean, if you were to look at the human genome, you would, and you saw a, a transcription factor binding that close to the start of transcription, there would probably be very little doubt in your mind that that's, that, that transcription factor binds, uh, regulates that gene, just because there's a lot more space in between genes and introns are a lot bigger as well. And this is not, this isn't unique to Arabidopsis. There are, most other plants kind of look like this in terms of the spacing and the size of the gene. Cool. Um, are there any other questions from uh, students for Nolan or um, the person who is who is named on Zoom as Igby Hep Helper is uh, Dr. Anne Lorraine from UNC Charlotte. Um, so questions for Anne or Rob or Nolan. I, I was going to quickly just show how to change the scale on graphs. Um, graphs can really, you know, if you're looking at a whole chromosome, the scale of a graph could be pretty large, you know, from zero to tens to hundreds of thousands. And I might have just tried to load too much data. Um, So for bed graphs, they are graphs. So the main thing is um, all control of, of um, 
changing that is done with the graph tab. And you kind of have two main controls that you're interested in, height and y-axis scale. Um, in this case, if we want to change the scale of that y-axis, we've got a couple sliders here. Um, you can kind of see this change as I go. So I'm just setting the max and the min. So the min set to zero and uh, in this case, I guess the max would be set to like, I'd say probably a hundred would be good. Um, the height would then just change kind of the height of that track to give it more space if needed. So if you were looking at multiple tracks at the same time, you'd want to make sure that you had them all set to the same max so that you could compare them. Yeah, exactly. So, and that can be pretty telling, you know, I mean, if I'm looking at one, you know, and I'm looking at it like that, you know, obviously that's not a fair comparison. So if you um, select both of the tracks, um, I'm on a max, so I'm gonna shift and then click on both of these. And then if I adjust that, it'll put them both on the same scale, so. Oh, Nolan, while you're here, could you show us how to overlay these two tracks? Yeah, so actually what I've just done, so I'm gonna, you know, shift click to select both of them. And then down here in the multi-graph, so under graph tab, multi-graph, I'm gonna join them. So now they're effectively one joined graph. Um, doesn't look any different, except now that if I hit this little minus, I'm gonna collapse them onto each other. Ah. Oh. And it, I, I always get this wrong, but the order in which you click on them determines which one is in front and which one is in back. Um, so if you need to undo it, you just select the joint graphs, split them up into two graphs again. I'm not sure which one, uh, maybe I think, see if this works. Okay, so I selected yeah. the blue one first and that one ended up being in front of the red one. So you'd want the one that was generally taller to be in the back. Yeah. So this would be handy, for example, to overlay RNA-seq data and chip-seq data if you wanted to really visualize like the relationship between a particular transcription factor binding a region and where the RNA is getting made. Yeah, and so that, that's what like this image was I was showing earlier. So these are you know two RNA seq studies that are then overlaid into one track, um, and then uh, a chip seq that's also overlaid there. And then I've just you know color coded them accordingly. Cool. Yeah. So is there any other questions? I think that is great. So thanks a lot, Nolan. Would, would everybody, um, everybody who's still there, um, please join me in thanking Nolan. And you can do that either by unmuting and clapping um, or by virtually clapping <laughs> or however you wanna do that. So thanks a lot. And Rob and Ann too. Yeah, and Rob and Ann too. Um, yeah, we really appreciate it. So I, I had a number of important things clarified for me today. Um, in addition to learning how to um, add data locally. And I think for the people who want to um, add more data to Igby, there's a path forward using Galaxy. So we'll get to work on that uh, right away. Yeah, so thank you everyone for having me. It's, it's always fun to go through Igby, so.